Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. I am, of course, Michael Morales, Director of Business and Consulting Services at Hawaiian Telecom. And I'd like to welcome everybody again to a Hawaiian Telecom University event on LinkedIn Live. And with me today, of course, is Mr. Jordan Silva, Senior Manager of Service Delivery. How you doing, Jordan? Pretty good, pretty good. How you doing today, Mike? Pretty good. I'm, I'm excited about today's conversation, my friend. So today Dude. we're going to get a little more in deep. We're going to talk about defense in depth. And I know, you know, when we talk about that, we, we kind of made this kind of analogy or, or, or parallel to many of the castles and modern networks. So the first thing I want to say, Jordan, is you shall not pass. So my friend, <laughs> where do we start in this conversation, sir? Yeah, I mean, defense in depth is a big topic. You know, we talk about it all the time. And uh, it turns out starting is really simple. Um, you just have to know kind of what you have. Uh, I think a lot of businesses, when we first kind of get started talking about like security and protecting everything, it quickly gets overwhelming. But the first step really is understanding what exists in your environment, because you have to know what you're trying to protect. Uh, you know, as we we sort of go through this evolution of businesses and businesses grow kind of organically over time. We find that stuff just, you know, shows up and it gets added to a network and we do our best to keep it tidy, but everybody's busy and doing the next project. And sometimes some stuff gets left behind and sometimes projects get half completed and you have to sort of understand what's there and then you can start prioritizing stuff. So challenge one, I mean, is often just what are we trying to protect here and, and what, what are we like, what do we have to do it with? Um, and that's where we kind of go. And I think to, to kind of get rid of some of that overwhelming feeling, it, it's helpful to think from it, think at it, uh, from a think about it as like a cyclical journey, right? We want to be iterative. Um, you know, growing up, I spent a lot of my time playing video games like uh, Age of Empires. So when we start talking about defense in depth, I always think back to that because I'm pretty sure that game built me for this career. Like we start building out these villages and you start off with like these wooden walls and, you know, you're like, man, I have to build bigger walls so no one can attack me. But you realize that if you just only invest in the walls, other stuff is vulnerable. So you have to kind of build some wooden walls. Then you go build a barracks and you build some other defenses. And eventually the wooden walls aren't good enough. So you come back and you build stone walls. And defense for a business is very much the same, where you, you start out by protecting things in whatever the simple format is. It might be, you know, installing a basic firewall. It could be in putting in some file protections. And then you know, you pause and you sort of evaluate and you say, okay, well, I have this, but what's the weak link now? And you, you go and iterate on that. And if you keep that as sort of your mindset, it, it makes it a lot less overwhelming and a lot less scary to sort of tackle. So that's where I'd say we start. And and really understanding that there's a, there's a big diminishing return effect on investing in security in a lot of ways, like everything else, right? Like if we get a really good firewall and we put that in place, and we ignore everything else. We just want to buy a slightly better firewall. You know, getting from like zero to 50% good will cost the same as probably getting from like 50 to 80%. And that'll cost the same as getting from 80 to 90. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to just pile resources and pile effort into one little space. And that's why defense in depth is kind of like magic is you spread out the, the workload and you sort of um, make sure you're, you're iterating and you're, you're picking on like the low hanging fruit all the time. And then it, it's awesome and it's much easier to tackle. Jordan, I like your uh, parallel to Age of Empires. You know, I was playing like Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and, and it didn't have the same parallel to what you're talking about. But when you talk about some of these things and especially the layers, you know, what I think about is, you know, that TV show, Get Smart. And it, used, it was also a movie with Steve Carell. So you have these layers of, of protection and like Maxwell Smart goes through various perimeter layers. So you mentioned firewalls and, and that would be one perimeter, but what are other parts of like perimeter defense and stuff like that? For sure, you know, like building really good walls is an awesome start, but we don't, we can't work and function in isolation. As a business, we need to communicate with the outside world, you know, with work from home being more popular than ever we're inevitably gonna start putting openings in that wall. And that makes a lot of sense because you wanna be able to use the data. Um, even when we start talking about like the CIA triad and things, availability of the information is critical. So like having the best info in the world is pretty useless if you can't get to it. Um, so what we have to start thinking about is, well, if we're gonna put holes in this nice wall that we just built, how do we make sure the stuff coming in and out of those doorways, if you will, is, is protected or safe? And we wanna make sure the good guys are coming in and the bad guys aren't. So we start talking about things like firewalls, obviously, but also spam filters are another one. 
where you know we, we we use email more than ever probably and every business is kind of using it at this point and um when we start thinking about things like ransomware phishing is usually the the culprit behind how people get infected so a really strong spam filter um, is probably the next in line after a really good firewall. And then you also have to think through how you're doing things like remote access. If you want people working from home, are you using a VPN? If you're going to use a VPN, are you using things like multi-factor authentication, right? Are you adding that one extra lock at that doorway to make sure that the person coming in is really who they say they are? And you're making sure that if somebody comes into the network, they're supposed to be there. It makes sense. And, and as you kind of talk about that, so you have these walls, you have these gates, for example, or bridges, right, to let people in at a certain time. But what happens, you know, when you're trying to close this stuff and then somebody gets through it, they, they get past the walls or the gates anyway? You know, it'll happen. So let's just start with somebody's definitely going to get past, past the gates at one point or another. No wall is perfect. No, no method of protection is perfect. So what you have to then start doing is kind of think about it like your house or your castle, right? Just because we have a lock on the front door doesn't mean we don't put doors on individual rooms. And the same goes through with security. You don't just leave all your file access open to everybody just because there's a really strong door on the outside. Um, traditional file permissions are still really critical. Configuration of your software is really critical to make sure, you know, the people who should have access have it and those who don't, don't. And it, it serves a couple of purposes. It, it stops traditional threats like, you know, you don't want every employee having access to all of your payroll data. You don't want every employee having access to all of your HR data. Um, but it also slows down the attacker if they get past that wall. So if somebody is able to get past the wall, maybe the account they use to get past doesn't have access to the most important stuff. Uh, it, it, it really slows them down and it forces them to either compromise another account or another system. And as a defender, that's helpful because it's almost like a tripwire system, right? Mm -hmm. If all your files are only set up so Mike can access them and Jordan's account gets compromised and starts trying to access all that stuff. Now you have all these logs saying, hey, access denied, access denied, access denied, because I'm fiddling with stuff I'm not supposed to be fiddling with. And if you implement a monitoring tool that can look for that kind of stuff, now you kind of have a, a detection device that says, hey, there's something weird going on here. At the very least, you should go look at it. So you're, you're not only stopping them, but you're giving your team the ability to now react to what's going on. So those kinds of layers, even once you're in the network, have to sort of be there. Uh, and, and you want to set up early warning systems like that. And, and you know, so now we're painting a picture here, right? And, and we're showing people like you have to first have that first line of defense. Then you have that second line of defense. But then also you're protecting different things in different ways. I'm going to tell you, Jordan, once you start getting past like 10 things, I actually start to lose some of these things too. So surely people out there are thinking something or myself or, or uh, people listening, something's going to get missed. You know, you, you got a lot of things going on. So uh, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that kind of thing? Yeah. I think like right now, one of the popular buzzwords that everybody's throwing around is like the idea of zero trust. And while it is super buzzy currently, um, it has some significant meaning, right? Zero trust is kind of the idea that you're going to be presumed compromised. And that means that you should behave in a manner that there's a bad guy already on your network. And some of the ways we do that are about, are doing simple things, right? Like keeping things like multi-factor authentication enabled, even for internal applications or, or setting up correct file permissions and auditing and things like that. So the idea is that not only are you likely to miss something, but the bad guy is going to find that something and they're definitely going to get in as a result. So as you're setting up your defenses, you kind of have to look at all the different points where not necessarily where you can put a defense, but maybe like or look for openings where you you could monitor stuff where, you know, a firewall is a natural entry point. So obviously you're going to monitor your firewall. But what are those other kind of gateway areas of your network? Is there a separate subnet that your servers are on? Should you be monitoring traffic between, you know, your workstation subnet and your server subnet? Or if you're in an organization that has to deal with compliance like PCI, do you have a PCI VLAN out there or a PCI segmented uh, segment of your network? And is there a something you can do to look for traffic between the two, like the safe area and the slightly less safe area? Uh, things like that come in real handy. And um, when you're talking about even like WAN to LAN, you think start thinking about things like DMZs and how you architect your network to kind of put in these little traps along the way to ensure that when somebody does get past one, there's still something else or another layer that's going to slow them down or discourage them or set off a warning bell somewhere. But that idea of zero trust is sort of paramount now, especially with 
all of our assets no longer just being piled in the middle of somewhere, right? Like it was a lot easier when everything was just in one building we could sort of lock up at the end of the day. Now, I mean, things are in the cloud, they're at work, they're on laptops that people are taking home, they're, they're kind of spread out. So you need to have these layers sort of all over the place. Yeah. So when you have the, you, these layers and, and when you talk about the DMZ, I know people are kind of wondering, what are you talking about when you say DMZ, the demilitarized zone? That's what I always think about, you know, that, that area, yeah, where it's it, it's almost feels like a safe haven, but it's not, you know. So, you know, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that before yeah. we move on to the next thing. but Sure. Like a DMZ is sort of a it's an untrusted kind of trusted area, right? It sits between the the wild, wild west that is the Internet and your nice protected internal network, because there are gonna be assets on the network that do need to be exposed to the internet to an extent. So if you're hosting a web application that maybe has like a SQL database, you might put the web server in the DMZ, but tuck that SQL database server in behind like the really good firewall. And that way, if somebody is accessing portions of your network, they're only getting to that web server and you can kind of restrict that and monitor that. And they don't have any direct way to get to that database except through the web server like they're supposed to. So it's just about adding in a little buffer zone and a, an area that's, you know, it's semi-exposed, it's controlled, but still keeps the really, really valuable stuff tucked behind another firewall. That, that's good. Somebody just teams or texted uh, DMZ equals all ports open. <laughs> no, most definitely not. Um, definitely not. Uh, you should never have all ports open. That would be, that's, that's leaving the front doors unlocked and kind of throwing up a flag that says all pirates welcome or something. Um, no, we, we definitely in the DMZ want to restrict to just what's needed. So if it's a web server, you're looking at things like port 443, right? HTTPS. Um, yeah. You're still definitely limiting stuff to the best of your ability. Yeah, I would say so. So I just like that. And and guys, just feel free to just throw things in there. We'll respond to it. Um, you know, so so you know, we're we're putting all these things in place, really. But wouldn't detecting a compromise kind of be easy? I mean, don't they just kind of like encrypt your data and break stuff, and then you they ask for ransom? Um. Yeah. Sometimes, but you know, I, I was reading a report from IBM recently, and I think they were saying that. In 2022, the average time to detect like a breach is up to something like 250 or 280 days. It's it's incredibly long. And the reason for that is attacks vary, right? Like ransomware is one kind of attack and it's a prolific one right now. But what we're seeing a lot from a trend perspective is they're not just kind of dropping in to attack your stuff and, and ransom it and leave. One, they don't always have that capability. If they get access to your network and the access they get is on a limited account, say they breach like a contractor's account that you forgot to just turn off, that account probably doesn't have access to all the cool valuable stuff that's worth the ransom. So they have to do what we call lateral movement. And that means they get into your kind of network and they look for a pivot point to kind of jump off to something more valuable. So maybe now they use that comp- contractor account to send off an email to you know, HR and say, hey, reset this person's password because now it's an internal account and it has a little bit more validity in those kinds of requests. So they might use whatever that initial breach point is to gain access somewhere else. Or in the case of vulnerabilities in software, now that they're inside the network, all those servers that we thought the firewall were protecting and, you know, maybe people deprioritize their patching on because they weren't exposed to the internet. Now that bad guy's inside and can use those vulnerabilities to gain the access they want. So it it doesn't always happen immediately. It can take days or weeks for them to one, get the complete access they need. um, But two, kind of pull off the attack. And even if we're looking at things like ransomware as a service now, because we're in the business of providing security as a service, there's bad guys in the business of breaching networks as a service. They might breach the network initially and then sell that access to somebody else who's going to go kick off the ransomware. They're, They're making their money on the breach. They don't care about what happens after that. So There are delays. Um, And then there's also things like um, exfiltration of data is getting more and more popular, right? I think I just posted a thing to our uh, HTU LinkedIn group because it was a cool article. They were talking about how uh, because the uh, price of cryptocurrency is dropping, ransom is becoming less profitable. So now, and, and people are getting better at backing stuff up. So the rate people are paying the ransom for encryption is going down. So they're pivoting as a business, right? Like they're shifting. Now they're stealing your data and they're threatening to release it to the world unless you pay them. So there's a lot of different w- reasons why that, you know, it's not just show up and attack, but also if the purpose of the attack isn't ransom and it's something like stealing intellectual property, 
um, that might take longer. They might need to, you know, evaluate your network internally. They might need to figure out how to get to that data. They might want to do it really slowly. Um, if the goal is to use your network as a pivot point to target one of your customers, mm -hmm. they're not going to do anything to your network. They're just going to sit there quietly and wait for the right time to then use you as kind of that launch pad. And, and we saw a lot of that with the big solar winds breach last year, right? Was solar yeah. winds got breached. They were meticulous about it. They, they, they compromised the vendor. There was a supply chain attack. Everybody who was using Orion or not everybody, but a lot of people who were using Orion were then compromised. And I think in the end, they said there were something like 15 or 18,000 active compromises, but a very tiny subset of that list moved on to their phase two, which was actual damage to networks. And it's because they were targeting the big boys first. They wanted the Microsofts. They wanted the state agencies. They wanted all those things. They weren't going to waste their time, you know, going after a little enterprise that didn't have that cool information and, and kind of show their cards. They, they just sat idle and they probably would have gotten to them eventually. But somebody caught on and luckily somebody caught on and we were able to resolve it. But that's what attackers do. They're, they're there for persistence. That's why we call them APTs, advanced persistent yeah. threats is the goal is to be quiet until it's time. And we don't always know when that time for them is. Exactly. And, and, and you, you know, when you talked about that with with with, with solar winds and, and some of these other kind of attacks, you know, where you have like these large kind of big boxes or what have you that have been attacked and they've just collected all this credit card information. People are just these these guys, these hackers are just sitting there forever. I do see Jason wanted to just clarify what he meant and it's unprotected. Makes sense to me there. And Russell, of course, uh, talking about oh, ports open kind of like we're over here. I like that one, too. <laughs> so. But uh, sure. yeah, so you, you, you definitely, I mean, this is something that, you know, we're talking more about, we'll shift gears a little, not really shift, but talk about ransomware attacks. And, and they're coming on almost a daily basis, even with all this protection, it, it's almost inevitable. It's kind of like, you know what I'm thinking now, Jordan, I'm thinking about, um, you know, um, when Voldemort's attacking Hogwarts and they, he's got a bunch of guys out and they're just shooting and shooting and shooting. Now, eventually security there just doesn't work and, and they're getting through. So so what happens when that security kind of breaks down? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the important things to remember is like, this isn't a fair fight, right? We're not in a, a we're not like, you know, Civil War soldiers kind of lining up on a battlefield and everybody's being honorable and, or, and, and you know, there's revolutionary redcoats on one side of the line or things like that. It's, this is, the bad guys do everything they can to be sneaky and deceitful. And the good guys have to be right 100% of the time because the one time we're wrong, they get an entryway. So you have to kind of act with that in mind where you don't get to be wrong. We don't get weekends. We don't get to just relax and say, okay, you know, it's 5 p.m., no more bad guys. In fact, they're, they're looking for those openings. A lot of the big attacks uh, against like Kaseya and things like that, they intentionally compromised and then waited for a long weekend to execute anything. So mm -hmm. they were in, they set the stage, they were there, they were quietly waiting. And the minute they thought everybody was running a skeleton crew because there was a three-day weekend, they hammered people like bad guys are bad. They're not, they're not here to fight fair. So first, yeah, that that's exactly right. We're, we're going to get bombarded and it'll inevitably fail. So, you know, the walls are going to crumble at some point. Somebody's going to sneak in and weasel their way through a crack somewhere. There's going to be a zero day exploit. We don't even know is a vulnerability and they're going to use that against us. Like there's a thousand things we can miss, even if we do everything right, because we're using tools that are imperfect, right? Like, no software is perfect. It's all fallible. So you also have to have things like backups. Like you can't rely only on defense. At some point, you have to just have kind of another copy of stuff. And, you know, the rule with backups, we call it the three, two, one rule, right? Is you have three copies of your data. One of it is live. Two of them are backups. And one of those backups should just be somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that, you know, the firewall fails. The bad guy gets in. They uh, encrypt all your stuff. At least you have another copy of it. If you're only using a copy that's attached to the original data or that's sitting on the same network, they might find it and encrypt that too. So you got to get something out of the building. And that helps a lot even with natural disasters, which we talked about last time, right? Hurricane comes rolling through. You don't want all your backups sitting in the same room that's now collapsed or flooded as the original data. So that three, two, one rule is really, really important for these discussions. Yeah, Jordan, it's almost like putting all your gold in one castle. You got to kind of spread it around. <laughs> you know, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Maybe it's a knuckle curve. But, you know, even with the solar winds attack, um, what happened was the people that had um, solar winds uh, or, or the cloud based application um, for 
uh, one of those attacks, maybe it wasn't solar winds, actually it was something else, Kronos. And the application on, on the cloud-based application was the one that got impacted. Um, and, and the people that actually had the on-premise application actually had it work. So, I mean, in those kind of like situations, you know, people are kind of moving towards one evolution. And you know what? Maybe that might be a good conversation, migration of application to cloud-based services, maybe for another day. We're going to tease something out, guys. We're just going to talk about it, maybe just for a little second here. Jordan, what, what do you think about that? And how do you handle some of that stuff? I think that, one, it's definitely a good topic for the next time we do this. But um, I, that's one of the challenges and probably one of the misconceptions about moving to like software as a service applications. I think a lot of the time people believe that the vendors who are hosting those applications, so the Microsofts, the Googles, the Amazons, they're now responsible for your backups. And I think you'll generally find that if you read the agreement with them, they very clearly state they're not. So any backups they may or may not have, that's for their protection, right? They're doing their own disaster recovery, their own business continuity planning. It's not for your protection. So even if you are moving to the cloud, this 321 rule doesn't really go away. It just changes a little. Tools like OneDrive or SharePoint have versioning, and that's super helpful, right? It's the equivalent of like Shadow Protect on um, or previous versions on on-premise versions of Windows. But that never changed the fact that you needed a copy or an immutable copy even where it's completely separate from your devices. It's completely separate from that instance. And, and that protects you from all kinds of things, right? It's there, it's highly unlikely that Microsoft goes out of business. So you're not really at risk of that, not immediately and not overnight anyway, right? So they're probably not going to just shutter up their data centers and you're, you're locked out of your data. But they're not immune to outages. Every one of these major people have had large outages. And depending on the business you're in, that has to be a, a part of your risk assessment, right? Is how long can you be without that data? And if that window is very, very small, you better have a copy of that data that's not reliant on them being online. And that is still 100% valid for cloud applications. So part of that evaluation process, we can dive really into that is yeah. um, when you're picking your providers, understanding what your responsibility is with them, how are they protecting themselves against these types of attacks, this ransomware? Because providers get attacked all the time. I think um, there was a dental provider right now, I think over the last weekend, there was like 100 um, dental offices offline because the provider was compromised. And big providers like that, I mean, they're going to try to recover. I doubt they, the ransoms for them are a whole lot bigger. So there's there's a lot more business to, to kind of do there. But I mean, you got to do your due diligence as well. Make sure you're picking really good vendors. Make sure you understand what their plans are, what their weaknesses are, and make sure you're accounting for that because it's still your data. Like yeah. you're the one at risk, right? So ultimately you are responsible for the survival of your business and it's your plan that's going to save you. It's not Microsoft's, it's not Google's, it's not Amazon. Like if you get attacked by something and you can't restore from their cloud, they're probably not showing up to help you recover it unless you're a giant, giant organization um, you're on your own. So make sure you're protected. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I know we have a couple minutes left and, and yet, yeah, Tian, I'll, I'll continue to make references to movies. Of, of course, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, the, the one more thing, cause I think we have a couple more minutes. I'm just going to throw this out to you, Jordan. So guys, we haven't scripted this at all. I'm just throwing stuff out to Jordan. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> what happens and this happened well, yes. also to a company <laughs> where internally a bunch of people had left the company, but before they did, they impacted the network internally and then they left. And I'm not going to name names about that, but you know what happened? There's things that happen like that too. Yeah, I mean, insider threats are definitely an issue, right? Uh, we see that there's been a couple of high profile cases, even with managed service providers. It's those are the bad guys that mm -hmm. give our industry a rough name. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'll say that it's a really silly way to behave because you're going to get caught and yep. there's legal repercussions for that. You don't get to just reset passwords and walk away and laugh at your old, your old company as they exactly. suffer. Um, but as a business, I think that's where a strong HR policy actually comes into play, right? Like, if you think somebody is a risk, this is where, like, I give a lot of talks on culture and things like that. This is the, the culture part of security, right? Is it's paying attention to your employees. It's understanding insider threats. It's, hey, why is Bob all of a sudden showing up for work at 2 a.m. and staying till 5 a.m. when normally he's an 8 to 5 kind of guy? Like, that's weird behavior. You need to start asking questions about, hey, that, that's really odd. Like, is he coming in because, you know, something's going on? Is he trying to hide something or... Or is he just coming in to catch up on work and he really likes working in the middle of the night? Like you have to start noticing that kind of behavior and having those conversations. And then from a policy perspective, 
really understanding if you're going to terminate people, which will, which will happen, right? Every business to the best of, I mean, sometimes we just have to let people go. That's not ideal, but you know, you have to make sure the right people are notified before that person becomes a threat, right? You know, yeah. it's, it, it, sometimes it feels like almost inhumane, but it's not, you got to turn down accounts. You got to let the help desk know that uh, this person, you know, they just got walked into an office, turn off the account right now before we let them out of that office, yeah. escort them to their desk, make sure they're not taking anything and, and make sure that you're not just, you know, putting yourself in a position where one person can do that level of damage. There's, there's a check and balance that has to be in place. And that's part of a lot of the controls we talk about a lot of the time. We, we uh, use the sys controls framework a lot. Uh, we're doing an HCU event. We'll talk about that in a second coming up, but that's a lot of what we're talking about is implementing these kind of procedural things and these concepts of audits and checks and balances and, and all that kind of non-technical stuff necessarily that adds to the security of your environment. Um, and, and that's really how you deal with that kind of stuff. You have to, it, it's a balance of a lot of different things. It's just more and more layers, right? Okay. Hey, Jordan, once again, good stuff. Um, I'm going to say this. Let me see if I could say this the right way. You, 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 you're good. You're good. You, you got a gift, my friend. You're good. <laughs> so um, thanks so much again. Hey, and thanks everybody for joining today. Um, you know, that. we hope you're able to learn something and uh, something new about, you know, how to protect your organization and, 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 and about cybersecurity. Now, I'm going to say this. I know Jordan is very deeply passionate about it. And uh, Jordan, we have something else coming up real soon. You want to talk about that? Right. So um, for the first time in, I think, two years, we get to do one of these events live uh, again. So um, we'll, registration emails will probably be getting sent out, I'm sure, from our marketing team. But we'll be doing it on September 14th. Um, and I'm super excited. We get to meet with people face to face, not just through a, a, a webcam. And uh, you should definitely check it out. Join us. We'll be, I think, doing four separate sessions. Uh, we'll do, be doing kind of some overview stuff. We'll be doing um, some sys controls at a very technical level. So if you're the engineering nerd like me and you just want to show up and learn some best practices about Office 365 and firewall configs and, uh, and talk about uh, how to build the DMZ tactically, yeah, let's do it. We're, uh, I think Mike Taratko is going to be doing a session on our sys controls from a managerial perspective. It's going to be gold. Like, uh, I'm super, super excited about the whole thing. So I think we have a QR code that'll probably pop up in a minute. You can scan there it. Is. You can register. Um, yep. Definitely show up. Come hang out. I think there's even snacks. Uh, like That's why I'm showing up other than to just talk about this stuff. But I was promised snacks. Uh, <laughs> so we'll be there. Absolutely. You know, I'll be there too. Um, I'm definitely going to think of some more references for everybody on the panels that I moderate. Really appreciate everybody for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you in person on September 14th. So, hey, guys, have a great rest of your day. And aloha. Thanks so much. Have a great one, everyone.